this pandemic began, we were not sure how it spread. Everyone began wearing masks and using hand sanitizers. Susan, Great ways to anything. slow the spread, but a lot of people still get sick. I can personally attest to that. We now know that COVID-19 spreads okay, via Ken. aerosols and droplets. From okay. the nose and, mouth. and I've been thinking about this for a while. Why aren't we also sanitizing the nose and mouth, killing the virus directly at the place where it spreads? Why weren't more doctors thinking about this? Well, some doctors have done the research. Wish I discovered it sooner. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Halidine. It's an FDA-registered antiseptic for the nose and mouth that's proven to eliminate 99.99% .99 of the virus that causes COVID-19 in just 15 seconds. That's right. It was created by a team of clinicians with decades of experience in antiviral treatments, initially created to protect healthcare workers. These are smart scientists, and it's a great product that also eliminates many other viruses and infecting particles. I'm using both their nasal antiseptic swab and their oral spray to help protect those around me, and you should be too. For others and for yourself, whether you're hopping on a three-hour flight, always use it there, visiting grandparents or attending a meeting that you can't miss, Halodyne's family of oral and nasal antiseptics give you the safe, easy, on-the-go antiviral protection for up to four hours. I encourage you to try Halodyne at Halodyne.com today. My listeners get 10% off with the discount code Dr. Drew. That is H-A-L-O-D-I-N-E.com, discount code D-R-D-R-E-W. So obvious, it just makes sense. Stop the virus before it spreads and gets in your body with Halodyne. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. True. Indeed, that is. Oh, Valor Allen in the house watching on the Restream thread. <laughs> uh, and Mark Gill is asking about Halodyne, how it works. It literally displaces the virus before it has a chance to get in. It makes masks work better, and the data is quite impressive. That's why I got behind those guys. Today, my guest is Ken Linder, career developer, author, founder of Positive Life Choice Psychology. The new book is Career Choreography. Uh, Ken has represented, as Ken, Susan pointed out before the mic's heated up, she goes, uh, he's the agent of everybody. <laughs> I thought, and so let me list some of those people. Because I have a bio. I go, look, well, look. Lester, Lester Holt, Mario Lopez, Megan Kelly, Robin Mead, Liz Clayman, Anna Cabrera, Nancy O'Dell, et cetera, et cetera, and the great Colleen Williams, of course, who is uh, our dear friend and one of the big, uh, I mean, I would say one of the most legendary newscasters in the history of Los Angeles Amen, news. Sister. Yeah, yeah. So, Ken, welcome. Dr. Drew, pleasure to be with you. So lots of buzz about the book. I read all the different um, blurbs. I mean, everyone is ringing in on this thing with, uh, with excitement. Uh, career psychology, excuse me, career choreography. His previous book was on toxic emotions. I want to talk about that a little bit when we get, get going here. But how did this, oh, even Mario Lopez gave you a little, Ken Linder's brilliant strategies have certainly helped shape and grow my career. Mario, well done. Nice guy. So tell me about the book, how it happened, and uh, what we can expect to find in it. Well, Dr. Drew, I trademarked the term career choreography about 25 years ago because I believe that there is a logical set of steps that anyone can take to put the percentages in their favor that they can attain their career goals. Mm -hmm. So the key is I always love to see what can be in people see where they are now and figure out the steps to help them live their career dreams. So I've been doing this for over 35 years. I've helped thousands of individuals find jobs in which they can thrive. And I thought with the pandemic, I've got time. Nobody's being hired. I had weekends. So I wrote this book. It's been a passion project of mine for years. The pandemic gave me the opportunity to do it, and I'm here to help people get into the workforce, get back into the workforce, make a fulfilling professional pivot if you're not happy with the job that you're in, and also help people who are 45 and over navigate getting back into a, uh, a very difficult job market. Who is your primary reader? In other words, uh, is there a person in mind as you wrote the book or, or, or at least to cult, to groupings of people? Actually, all of those people, anybody who's looking to work and also more importantly or as importantly, anybody who's looking to find a job that really fits with their skill sets, what they love to do, what they don't want to do. Try to find something for them that will make their heart sing. And what if, what if I'm thinking, of, I'm going to go down my own rabbit hole for a couple of seconds here. Sure. I, I've never had 
goals per se. It's all been like an improvisation, more of an explore, exploration. Like I, something comes along and I go, I, I, let's go through that door and see if I can turn it into something worthwhile. What do you do with people like me? We would just talk about what it is you love to do and what it is you're really good at. And the key is to put you in a vehicle that will showcase your gifts. You know, for example, you know, Oprah was a tremendous anchor in Baltimore, but when she became a host, she got exponentially better because hosting allowed her to interview, to ad lib, to um, showcase her soul and her life experiences. You can't do that just reading to prompter. So I'm a huge proponent for anybody in any industry to get into a job which showcases and takes great advantage of what you do well, because the chances are, You'll enjoy it, and you'll be hugely successful. Do you think she knew that she – I'm sure she knew she was a good interviewer. Do you think she knew that she was a good talk show host? I have no idea because I don't <laughs> represent her. One, there's one, I found one person. I found one person you don't represent. <laughs> but I will tell you that I think there are certainly certain people who are much better being able to go off script mm. than, be, than reading a prompter. Mm -hmm. Conversely – there are some people who aren't good at libbers who don't feel comfortable bantering or really being open and authentic. And those are the people who should be reading prompter. Mm. So again, if you sort of translate this out, what I would try to do with anybody out there is to try to find out what their passions are, what they're really good at, what their experiences have prepared them to do and try to pair them with that job that will allow them to be all they can be and self-actualize. How did this book come about? Well, it really came about through uh, everything I do every day. I mean, this is what I do uh, with broadcasters. But about 15 years ago, I had written Your Killer Emotions, and I'd done some book work. And I talked about choreographies. And I got a lot of emails asking me to give people choreographies, especially with the economic downturn. A lot of people had lost their jobs. So I decided on the side uh, for fun, gratis, to help people outside of broadcasting find jobs that I thought would be great, um, uh, sort of very compatible with what they did. And I've been doing this for 15 years, which is why most of the stories in career choreography and the steps relate to non-broadcasting individuals. I wanted this to be a book for everyone. And there are certain commonalities in any profession that one would use to find your dream job and, and one that you'll in all likelihood be successful in. Describe what you mean by choreographies. What does that mean? Well, choreography, for example, is um, a set of steps, as I mentioned, that will put the percentages in your favor that you'll be a great candidate for the jobs that either you're very good at or that you dream about. With, without, example, without, yeah, without giving away too much of the book, we want them to read the book, but, but give me an example of a couple of the steps. Okay, so for, well, for example, let me um, use a client, um, Lester Holt. For example, when Lester and I first got together, he was in Chicago in local news. And I knew that he was a great reporter. And we said that we're not sure what we're going to go for yet, very much as, as you just said to me, Dr. Drew, but I know what I'm good at and I can anchor and I love going out in the field. So we decided that we were going to try to find a national platform, which MSNBC became that platform. And during that time, we made sure he hosted shows, he anchored shows, and he went to the story. We didn't want him to be tethered to the anchor desk. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the great part about that was it left open every option. So when Weekend Today came open, we got it. When Weekend Nightly News came open, we got it. And, you know, those jobs, the big jobs, the Today Show job, main job, or the Nightly News main job, who knows if those ever come open. Right. In this case, Brian Williams left and Lester was the right person. But the interesting part is because he was such a good reporter, he advanced the field because he goes to the story, unlike many of the other anchors who just stay in the, in the studio, 
Lester Report. So we had a choreography of making sure that we left every option open and he was capable about, of getting any big job by making sure we got hosting, anchoring, and kept his reporting strong. So that's a choreography of, of leaving everything open. It's interesting. I'm watching a restream here, sort of the ch a chat on what your comments have been, and there's a lot of uh, interesting questions. And I'm just, I don't know that they're specifically pertinent to the, to the book, but I'm gonna gonna go through them with you. Uh, sure. Someone asked, uh, and Monica, I'm gonna get to your question in a second here. Uh, there was a lot of chatter in the in the chat room about you know what are your talents, what are your superpowers, how do you tell what they are. Do you get into that sort of thing in the book? This whole notion. I, I know some people talked about notion. They have a notion of, you know, what are your superpowers? Well, absolutely. What I talk about is, first of all, <laughs> step one, dig down deep and think about what you really want to do with your next job. Also, what you're really good at. And I don't know if that's what you call a superpower, but the key is you yeah. need to know what your assets are. What are your skill sets? What are you prepared to do because of your education and your background? You know, what is your experience? Hey, hey, and I, what I you told want you to I was, do is write I, a I told you I was going to interrupt. Here's one of my interruptions, which is I, I have noticed um, cognitive distortions are running amok in this country right now of all types, whether it's motivated reasoning or the, dis, you know, what, what this, you know, the, um, cognitive dissonance it's just it's just yes. wildly wild now and one of the things that is most prominent is a seeming inability to assess your assets uh, it's also called the dunning kruger syndrome where people don't know enough to know what they don't know i mean it, it's the thing that allows someone to get up at the american idol and sound like shit it, it's right. it, it's and there's a lot of that going on are there steps people can go through and I'm imagining it takes a bit of courage. Like, do you ask other people? Do you test things out in some way to find out what you, that if your assessment of your assets are accurate? Well, I think that's a really great question because I think one of the things you can do is ask people you trust, especially yeah. the ones who you work with, what do you think I'm good at? What do you think I should be doing? And if you see a, you know, uh, a convergence of the same opinions, that will help you. But I do talk, Drew, about, um, making sure that you're not defensive, mm. making sure that you are not using rationalizations uh, when you fill out these lists. You've got to be stone cold true with yourself because if the data you're using is skewed because you're lying to yourself or you're looking at things in ro rose colored glasses right. or you don't blame or you don't take ownership of the things you, you know, you've made mistakes, then the data and your findings are going to to not be pure and correct. So the key is, this is your chance to make an amazing, fulfilling new start, reset. Be honest with yourself, because if you're honest with yourself, the data you'll be giving yourself is true, and you'll be able to make really good decisions. So the key is, I call uh, what I'm saying a clarifying list. Write a list of all the things that you do really, really well, all the things you love, and all the things you don't want in you, your new job, because a clarifying list will clarify for you what you're really meant to do. And when you speak with a prospective employer, it clarifies for you what your assets are so that you can sell them accurately, articulate them compellingly to a prospective employer when you have your interview. Um, another thing that I think is really important, uh, just talking about getting back to work, and then I'll um, take another question or move forward. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is really important for everyone out there who's trying to get back to work, think about um, the people with whom you've worked, worked for, worked with, because those are the people who know the body of your work, know your contacts, know your work ethic, know the content of your character. Those are the people who might well either A, be able to hire you one day or recommend you compellingly to someone who can hire you. And as an example, my dad was laid off at 66 years old. He was working for a department store chain in New York. And I told him he never thought at 66 he'd be rehired because people often don't invest in people who are over 60. He was 66. I told him to keep in touch with all the people he knew. I told him to continue to re read the periodicals that would keep him relevant. So if he interviewed, he wouldn't miss a step. And to keep in touch with the people 
whom he hoped to do business with in the future. So he did all of that. Three long years later, one of the people who he had contacted, who was a buyer trainee of his early on, had become the president of Marshalls. And he called my dad and said, Jack, I'm just about to start a company called TJ Maxx. And I want you, who better than I knows what you can bring to teaching you know, our buyers and um, to negotiate deals, open up merchandising houses. At 69, my dad got hired for 30 more years. He had a career between 69 and 99. Mm. Wow. Working for TJ Maxx, mm. which I think is incredible. I just counseled a woman the other day who just got laid off uh, from an insurance company. She'd been there for 25 years. She said, I'm, I'm going to be 58. I did the same thing. And with about within about four weeks, she had contacted five different people. Two people offered her jobs, and she's now gainfully employed, doing what she did before by someone who knew exactly what she can bring to the table. So there's a lot of... Um you know, uh, chatter on my chat. Uh, you know, this where I'm come, keep going to this chat room. Um, they want to know what my superpowers are, what my assets are, and it might be an interesting exercise to kind of go through this. Um, so, I, from my perspective, uh, my assets are a bringing forward just a ridiculous amount of experience that gives me a, a, an uncanny sense of judgment about things medical, medical and psychiatric. I just have. I just know things. Uh, that's one. Another is um, because I worked with addicts and alcoholics so much, uh, I had to be a mind reader. And I, I wouldn't say there's such a thing as mind reading per se, but I will receive information from listening with my whole body that the average person doesn't know how to receive. I, 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 have, to, I have to not listen to people's words and listen to smells that occur to me and music that develops and, and try to make meaning of those sensory bodily based experiences that are coming from another person, not from me. I'm, I'll, I'll hear music and things I barely even recognize. Uh, and then thirdly, I've had the great privilege of spending a lot of time in front of a camera or behind a mic. So I can be kind of fearless in that environment. And also because my wife coaches me up so much, know how to pay attention to things that needed paying attention to. Uh, you have no idea how, how much, Susan, bear me up on this. You listening? Yeah, I'm listening. How much you had to coach me up on sound and, you know, how I looked at a camera. Remember all those conversations? Well, but that's what I did for a living. So I, I brought I, you that You were right. To the table. I didn't know. I thought, I, was, I, I, don't, I don't need to worry about that. And I thought, oh, mm, she's right. She's right. She made I me mean, he was a, kind of a nerdy doctor. He, he needed a little, a little polish. So well, uh, he certainly has that now. Mon <laughs> yes, he's, Monica yeah, he's doing well. says I can Better synthesize <laughs> information quickly and lead with empathy. That's that. That's that judgment thing. That all this, all this experience. I, I've had this uncanny experience medically that no one's getting right now, which is critical care medicine. Like I was going to be a cardiologist, hospital-based medicine, outpatient medicine, and inpatient psychiatry and addiction medicine. That those two experiences are just one person doesn't get them anymore. So it's gave me this sense of something that I want to push out. Anyway, what do I do with all those things? And that doesn't necessarily to me then go, Oh, I know exactly what I want to do. You know what I mean? That's what's the, what are the steps? What's the choreography? Or, or what, let's put it this way. Is, is, are these assets, are they sort of the um, dancer's ability coming to the choreographer or, or are they part of the steps? How do we, how do we keep that metaphor going? Well, Dr. Drew, I'm dying to answer this question. Okay. So here's the thing. There is a strategy which I talk about in my book, Career Choreography. Lead with your strength. So your strength is, is that you are um, a very, very um, knowledgeable physician. And you've got this great medical training. So, for example, look what happened to Rachel Ray. She was a cook. Mm -hmm. She got her own talk show, a chef, I'm sorry. And she got her own talk show. She found a platform and she was able to transcend. She used cooking, but she transcended that. Right. And um, there are a number of people who are able to transcend it and go way beyond what their expertise is, but they use their expertise to launch. 
and I can't say who it is, but it's a tremendously reputable doctor um, who I represented years ago. Everyone would know this person. And um, we were just about to get a morning talk show. It actually, for political reasons, didn't happen, but they saw how good this person was delivering his medical material. And they said they sort of extrapolated out that person could go way beyond where they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the things you're talking about are you um, you're intuitive, you're intuitive to a great degree. Yeah, that's intuition. You yeah. have a sense of people. Mm -hmm. You are compassionate. I mean, these are all things. And you've got you've got so much experience working with people who um, have addictions. I mean, that that's a lot. Which you, you've got great stories to tell. Mm. One of the reasons why I believe Oprah was so successful was because she didn't come from some cookie cutter background. She was able to dig deep and talk about things that were unusual in her, for her life, and and she was able to, you know, have empathy, compassion, sympathy for others, and, and it just added a lot. Tamron Hall, an example of somebody I believe her sister. Um, was killed. I'm not sure, but I think um, I think she had some a death in her family. I can't remember if it's her brother or sister, mm -hmm. but she has a life experience that she can talk about. I think you bring a wealth of knowledge and the kind of sensitivity that would make a great talk show host. And whether you started out um, with the medical and then branch out, the key is for somebody who is representing you or somebody who sees it to be able to say, this person can do a lot more. This person has a tremendous body of work behind the camera and um, is, is really good about opening up a window into the interviewee's soul because he's not afraid to express his opinions. And these days, someone who's not afraid to express their opinions can probably find a place somewhere because that's what we're all buying right now. Yeah, well, we're unless, unless you we're get... Not, Let's, you know, the, the problem with that today is that that, that is the per very person who is risking being canceled all the time, <laughs> that, right? If you well, have I an opinion. I think, it, I think it all depends upon if you're giving your opinion um, to people who want that opinion. I mean, look, we all know that there's certain cable stations that have this leaning. Another cable mm -hmm. station has that leaning. And if I if I watched one versus the other, I, I would think I'm li living in two different countries. Yes. You know, yes one person right. loves one candidate. The yep. other person loves the, you know, the president. And they see things through such different eyes. I think a lot depends upon your I think you're safe if you're giving your opinion to people that are wanting to hear that opinion. Yeah. Hmm. I think you have a, I think you have a tremendous potential to go beyond what you're doing. I and mean, with your podcast, you can host a talk show because oh, somebody I, has to see it. I, yeah, I well, it's I've had such a crazy long career. I, I did have a talk show on CW, uh, morning talk, a talk show. Oh, that's right. It was a syndicated talk show. And it then syndicated talk is rough, man. That is a tough <laughs> arena and it's hard to survive. It, I mean, nothing nothing right. survives, but that was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. I learned a ton uh -huh. doing it. Um, I'll tell you just a quick story. Leopold, I will get to your question in just a second. You know, I had a, they were, we were developing this thing. It was in full production and they bring in these consultants. What was one of the big consulting companies for Maggot? Maggot. They brought in Maggot. <laughs> and the guy sits all morning with me and talks with me and he's my buddy and he's telling me what to do. And he gave me some good advice. And then he goes up to the, the brass executive producer and, and he goes, uh, eh, he's not cut out for it. So cut, cut it, get, get rid of him, get, cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> and fast forward, thank God, Lisa G, God bless you, didn't listen to him. Um, she didn't listen to him. Fast forward three months into production, he actually came to a production of one of the episodes and he went, oh my God, I always knew you were a great talk show host. Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was, it was a, the, yeah, one of these classic moments, you know what I mean, in this business. Yes. Success has many fathers. Um, <laughs> by the way, I t see that's the kind of person, though. Lisa G is the kind of um, she's brilliant. Yeah. And she is a maverick. She's not afraid to take a shot. Yep. I mean, look, 
I don't, it's not like Billy Bush was a, a huge risk, but he wasn't the easiest person to, yeah. to um, put in extra. And she did it. And I think Billy Bush is great at what he does. And I think he's a perfect fit for what Lisa G wants to do. Lisa has a, a great sense of things and she is not afraid you know, to put herself on the line mm-hmm. with what she believes. Mm-hmm. Not everybody will do that, but Lisa is that person. Oh yeah, I have tremendous, Ooh, I have tremendous yeah. respect for her. And and by the way, as as the um, recipient of some of that too, it's it's for real. Uh, it's uh, it's it's always the same though. It's never it never way. And and by the way, equally as enthusiastically embracing and loving and you know supportive and all that Absolutely. stuff as she is critical and and difficult. Um, Okay, so here's Leopold's question. Leopold, I'm going to soften the question. No, 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 don't put it up there because it, it's too harsh the way he wrote it because okay. I, I, I feel like it, it leads the witness a little bit. Okay. So he's, he's asking a question about public service employees, and he's saying in the public sector, there's a lot of mediocrity, innovation is discouraged, promotions now are on the base of ethnicity and other considerations, merit is not a high um, consideration. What does someone do if they're in a situation like that? Well, I think, Leopold, it's really important to figure out what it is you do like about your job. I mean, there are a lot of things that you don't like. But the question is, do you like your job? And in my book, I talk about the fact if you're unhappy and you want to make a change, is it the job itself, what you're doing, or is it what's going on around you? Are you in a toxic environment? Is there too much mediocrity? Are you not supported? Yeah. Or are they giving you too much work because with COVID people have been laid off. So they had to put all this work on you. If it's the ancillary things, find a different place to do what you do. If it's what you do that you don't like, then you need to make a beneficial change. So figure out what it is that you're unhappy with. Let's try to get rid of those things and find a place, a different place, a better place, where you can use the skills that you have yeah. and you can do the things you like to do. Yes. I, w- I want to, as the maggot guy would say, hang a lantern on what you just said there about make a change. <laughs> I, I, the way he wrote the question, if I were sitting down, Leopold, just chatting with you, I go, dude, you sound really unhappy in this environment um, and, and your abilities are being squandered. So start looking for other opportunity it may not come today but if you really there's an ex, you know um scott adams who i've interviewed a couple times on this stream, which can brings me the question of these difficult issues of actually making change uh you, he, you know here he is he's unhappy he has a really rough question he asks and i would i would say oh this is you know i feel bad for him he needs to make a change but how do you make that change and i know i just i did a podcast for those of you uh, that are watching the Dr. Drew podcast or listening to that podcast. This woman wrote a book called How to Change. She is a um, business school professor, a, a behavioral scientist, and she really dug into the science of change. And I, I'm going to bet that you can would have alignment with her observations. So how does how does Leopold say get from the point of being resentful and disgruntled to actually making a change? Well, I think you really need to take time. I don't think anybody should do anything until they're psychologically and emotionally ready to do it. You know, one thing I talked about in my book, Your Killer Emotions, don't act out of emotion uh, if you're sad, hurt, angry, because then you tend to make a rash decision. It's not well thought out. It's reactionary. What you want to do is make a constructive, well thought out decision considering the long term and short term consequences. So. The key is I would really make a list of all the things that you don't like uh, in your current position, all the things that would be okay uh, in a new position, what changes you would need to make. In other words, figure out what your ideal is and see if that ideal or close to that ideal is available and think about it, do your homework, Mm. do your research, and don't make a move until you really feel like you're ready to move. And hopefully, if you do enough thinking and soul searching, you'll know that the time is right. Years ago, I worked for a major theatrical agency. And their philosophy at the time, even though I loved working there, was not in alignment with mine. And I saw that we were going opposite directions. It took me a while to figure out that it just wasn't the right place for me to be. 
But when I was ready, I was sure I was making the right decision. And I started my own company 33 years ago. Mm. And it turned out to be so the right decision. Um, but I did it for the right reasons, because I knew why I was leaving and what I was going to. So Leopold has followed up with us to say, golden handcuffs, salary and benefits are ridiculous, and I've been there for 30 years. So, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, be realistic about the risk, what the, the exchange you're making. You're, you're exchanging your resentments and all these other things for the golden handcuffs and for the salary. But in, in my world, what you might do, Leopold, is find other things that make you happy, other service oriented or hobbies or something that where you can be creative uh, away from the job or new relationships, whatever it might be, and not look for fulfillment in the job. Or be honest with yourself and say, I got to get out of here and figure out a timing for that. And maybe it's after you get your your golden handcuffs put on you, you're, 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 you're taken off, whatever, whatever's going to happen when you retire. I mean, you can always sort of delay gratification too, but go ahead, Ken, I'll let you answer. No, I, I think what you said is right. I think there, maybe there's, and this could be a little idealistic, but there is a third um, alternative. And that is, is there a way to make things better or mm. more tolerable where you are? Because you know, you're making money, you know, you have these benefits, you have a tremendous investment uh, it, with where you are. So before you leave, that's why you don't make a rash decision. Why don't you think about, are there things that can be remedied to make it better? You don't want to leave this thing until you've exhausted every opportunity to make it a better place for you, because then you have much more of a win-win. But again, the other part of it is you don't leave until you're sure that you're going to something that will be a better balance for you. Maybe you make a little less money, but you're much happier. Maybe you have better work-life balance. Maybe you spend more time at home. Who knows what the trade-offs are, but only you can you know, make those valuations. But they're valuations you should make before you leave. But again, see if there's a way to make it better where you are. That may be the best of all worlds. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah I, I agree. But it's not going to be easy. Don't like, tell them to stay home anymore, Ken. Uh, it, it can, it can, it we can work be... together. So, <laughs> okay. Go back out. Go back um, out. I, I love when he works. He's so happy. I know you're talking about everybody generally, but <laughs> I'm pointing to Drew because, you know, he's kind of in a weird transition right now. And it's just, I love the way he is when he's outside the home and he works and he, I know it makes him happy. He loves to travel and work. He loves to be in front of, large groups of people, you know, right. that's not my thing. Like I'm good about, I'm good at this, the tech stuff and just doing these little shows, but I don't want to be in front of the camera. I don't want to be in front of a bunch of people, but I love his personality. He gets, he feels stronger. He feels happier. You know, it's how he feels. It's not just because it's his job. He loves doing it. Mm. Well, I would tell you that if I won the lottery tomorrow, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. It, I, I, I love what I do. I love what I do. I get that. I get that. I, I, I could tell Susan what I told you when you said, you know, what's your bucket list or something? Yeah. We were, oh, my mic. Um, I felt about a year Re and a half. By the way, Rex is all over me. Pre-COVID. <laughs> I was like, I want to travel. I'm 60 years old. I want to get on a bus. I want to get on a plane. Let's go. And I said, what, what's your bucket list, Drew? And he goes, I'm doing it. And he was really working a lot. He was getting a lot of, uh, a lot done. And I was like, well, yep, married to a workaholic, definitely. <laughs> well, that's it. Yep, yep. But I said, well, I'm going to go somewhere. I hope you're coming. But um, it's it's just funny because that is what he loves to do the most. And it's I don't know if you've changed. Me? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, w one of the things that this woman points out in this book is she, she says that there are sort of moments of change that are especially good or opportunities for moments of change that are good. In other words, the research shows that people are more likely to change at the beginning of a week, at the beginning of a month, at the beginning of a year. Uh, she calls it um, fresh start, a fresh start, that some people get to this point where they go, I need a fresh start. I need to, I, I need to change. And I told her that I feel like I'm in, in evolution towards a fresh start. Uh, COVID was particularly 
unpleasant and traumatic for me. Having COVID was, you know, intense as well, and recovering took forever. Um, COVID stole everything about what Susan was just talking about, all my speaking and everything and traveling associate, everything gone. Um, so, yeah, it, those kinds of moments create opportunity for fresh starts. Absolutely. Um, no question. I mean, we always see fresh starts with new year, new me. Mm -hmm. But I think with COVID, we want a lot of fresh starts. I think we all want a fresh start. Absolutely. In a lot of ways. And, and you appreciate this, Ken. One of the things she also said, uh, you know, maintenance of change is a big, big deal. But one of the things that uh, is clear in the research is that much like a fighter who returns to his ring or her ring, the, the corner rather, they return to the corner and there is a coach and a water guy and a nice guy. And they're there supporting and scaffolding and encouraging and directing. It's not a great fighter necessarily in the corner. Now, the fighter may look up to other great fighters and may have spoken to other great fighters, but in the corner are people that are good at scaffolding and coaching. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with that. You know, Dr. Drew, you said something about change. Mm. I am really a huge proponent of continuing to evolve mm. always, of being a student of life, of continuing to try to get better. Yeah. And, and you know, my dad taught me uh, during that, you know, during that huge career he had, you've got to remain relevant. You can't stay stagnant. You've got to keep evolving. And I believe that um, in every way. So... Uh, I do think there are certain times for change that are more um, uh, that we can understand because you want a new start. But I believe every day is a chance to grow and learn and and try to think about the things you've done right, the things you've done wrong, and and try to be a wiser, uh, more evolved individual each day. So I'm all about change. And, and I like actually um, the challenge of putting myself out there being a little bit of a scientist and ex an experimenter to yeah. see what works for me. That's right. how I got better in tennis and everything else. You poach a little bit more, you try a shot down the line you haven't tried before. Don't be afraid to stretch. The worst thing is, you know, it doesn't work. But I found I've learned so much from my losses and my missteps. That's how I get my first big steps to sweet victories by learning, by finding out what my deficiencies are and then and making them better. Yes. And what I think we're, I'm very much that way. I, I, what you're saying is like breathing to me, but I don't, I'm not sure everyone's that way. What about people who may not be? Well, I think it's important to take baby steps then, because if you do things in a small way, you don't take that much of a risk and you just try it. I mean, literally, I remember playing tennis and I thought, okay, I'll just move a little bit more when my when my partner serves to see if I can cut that ball off. Mm. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but the payoffs were really good. But I tried baby steps. I didn't run across the net. I took a quick step across the net. Start slowly. Get your, get, if you're nervous, you're fearful, take baby steps and get those victories because those victories will give you the confidence to take bigger steps. It's really interesting. I remember Tiger Woods in his heyday, um, he was down by five strokes going into the final uh, day of play. He came back and won by two strokes. And the um, sportscaster said to him, you know, did you ever think you'd come back? And he said, yeah, I did, because I've done it before. So I knew I could do it again. That's another that really, kind of, yeah, that's another right? interesting thing, right? Which is that kind of core confidence. You've yeah. got to be able to do it to know you can do it. So you got to take the shot because once you take the shot and you and you accomplish it, that is core confidence that no one can take away from you. Yeah, it, it's it, that that. So so you're talking about experiential learning. The, the have yes. the, have done it, you know, the and that's um, that puts that puts you in a special category. You know what I mean? For him, that, that, what you're describing it was Tiger Woods. You're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that to have done that is uh, something that leaves open the door to having done it again. <laughs> you know, yes, I, if I did you, it once, I can do know, it again kind you, of thing. Right, you know you can. You yeah. know you can host the show. You've done it a yeah. million times. So what I'm saying to the listener and viewer out there is take baby steps just so you get some really great victories under your belt 
And you'll see that that positive reinforcement, that confidence, that those feelings of mastery, I think will encourage you, motivate you to take bigger leaps of faith. Mastery is a really interesting topic we have not talked about. What I'm doing here, Susan and Ken, I'm Wait, looking- Wait, I wanna, I, something just popped into my head. Okay. Remember when you told me you wanted to go to law school? Me? And I thought you were nuts. I, I was like, I was, yeah, I, right. What I it, was so frustrated at that point. That was when I was practicing medicine all right, the time. Right, but I was getting that was so- before COVID too, right? Long before. And you were like, no, you you like but, one day go, I'm going to go to law school. That was like 10 was years like, ago. When are you going to fit this in? Like, how is this going to work? <laughs> no, you were like... <laughs> 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 Susan is like my reality <laughs> do- <laughs> tester. It's like, I'm testing I'm reality. quitting like, medicine and be a lawyer. You're better than Susan. I was like, yeah, I'm okay. testing her. And she goes, are you, are you out of your mind? Okay, well, you could have during it, COVID. You right. might have well have gone, gone back to <laughs> law school for the last year and a half. You could have become a lawyer. Well, it was bef- well before Douglas was in law school because he, he is scratching that itch by having him, our son, in law school. Right. And Susan, what I'm doing here is I'm people are are really going nuts on the stream here about uh-huh. uh, when I was a lifeguard in Laguna. Uh-huh. And I know there's a picture in my phone. Somewhere. Oh, I know. Okay. So, <laughs> so you got to put that. Okay. Up. But also something that sort of pops into my head, you know, I know Drew was a great talk show host. It was such a great run. It was really fun all those years and radio. She, she's talking about HLN. You're talking about HLN. Well, well everything you did, you did, you did a radio yeah. show for 30 years. You did, you know, another radio show, you, you know, spun off, you did HLN, you did for five or six years. You did, you got to do teen mom. You're still doing that. Um, you know, you're great at hosting, but okay. you are, but I the, didn't, I didn't know this was going to be a, a, an assessment of me, No, but, <laughs> but, but okay. But I look at life differently. Like I see that I remember when, you were on Life Changers, and you were on... That's the daytime talk show. And, and how exciting that was and how fun it was. And I know that not everybody in the world can do that, but you got to. And it was so fantastic. But I know it came to an end. But but having those memories are enough for me. Like, I can just live <laughs> you're like happily... You're done and done. <laughs> I know you would love to do it again, but it's not like they're, you're going to get enough... Not everybody gets another no, no, second. No, 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 no. I, I totally get what you're saying. And... Ken, as someone who just described what it's like, so to speak, to be evolving and changing and not have to do it again, you know what I mean? So you're you're speaking my language when you talk about that. Susan didn't get it. She didn't get what you were saying. No, I got I do. what you were saying. I, well, I don't. She, yeah, she I thinks. Guess I don't. She thinks. She heard. Let, let's sort of. It's, it's interesting. She heard. You guys are developing and changing, so you stay relevant, so you can get another fill in the blank like you had before. And my my thing would be, I have no idea what I develop into or what's. Look at this thing you created here. We're participating in now. I didn't have. I didn't know what this was. I didn't have any image of this in my head. You said, "What the hell are you spending all that money for?" Yeah, I did say that <laughs> a lot. And, and I said, "You know what? We this is time. We need to do this." And it worked out. But but the point is that we're, this what what Ken was describing was just developing assets and see where the assets can get deployed. Wouldn't that be about the best way to say it? Yes. But Dr. Drew, I would like to say that, you know, just because, you know, something doesn't work out once doesn't mean you can't get back in the saddle and do it again. It's just the timing. Yep. And, you know, it takes one person to get it and to see it. I hear you. And that's all it takes sometimes to to have a a great So do you have to manifest that? that Like, do you have, if you really want that, do you just manifest it? No, you got to hire Ken. Yeah, you maybe okay. <laughs> or, a gra- or a or a or a great packaging agent who can put you together with a great producer, right? And get a great concept that takes advantage of your gifts and right. your strengths. Lead with your strength. And that's what I talk about. Right. You've got great strengths, and yeah. you are, and you've got a body of work that speaks for itself. And 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 we are literally literally one of the. One of the things that but took we're me, in tough times right now brought Clint, me back to Ken, my phone. Right. With the cancel culture and yeah. being, you yes. know. One of the things that brought me back to my phone, whatever. Susan, was, you know, one of the producers from a show that we might be doing this summer that is hopefully going to be exactly what Ken is describing. Yeah, yeah. So oh, I can't up. find that picture of me on the beach. Do you have uh, any of those? You, no, I don't keep. The uh, restream really wants I am wants horrible it. at Ooh, keeping. Ooh, one of you. I'm going to put that up. No, no. Yeah, come on. Come on, no. no. They don't need to see what I look like before children. No. I. It's It's just, it's sad to look at. What? <laughs> you still look the same to me. I, oh, thank you. Honey. That's so, so sweet. Beautiful. He's Dr. a wonderful Drew? man, sorry, Ken. Yeah, He's Ken. a wonderful it man. It sounds like it. It's great. I was going to say, Dr. Drew, also, 
you know, a particle in motion attracts other particles in motion. Yes. And I believe you be doing this show, whatever it is during the summer, that puts you back in motion. And it, yes. it may make it easier for others to visualize what can be. I, I know so exactly. I'm, I'm, he I, know. I, I talk about I talk about this in career choreography. Be that particle in motion because it you're out there now and people can see it. They can visualize it. And who knows where it goes? Yeah. Movement begets movement. Uh, or, yes. or, or as it. Lucille That's Ball, it. I saw her once say uh, later in life, she said, the busier you are, the busier you are. <laughs> I thought, I I thought yeah, that. she is so right about that. that well, he he true. tried to dabble in politics a little bit. Now we have bad taste in our mouth, so we're kind of eh, okay. <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> I the world is just sure. kind of weird right now. So, I mean, I yes. I think that Drew's talents will always be there, and he'll do more and more and more. It won't. He's it, it ain't over yet, Ken. That's but right. what makes him happy is. Having the next project, being in the next thing, and creating, yeah, I, you know, creating it's, things. I think yeah, when you like too. creating things, you like creating things. It's hard not to do that. It's, that's no. what you like. It's a skill though, in though, itself, you know. Though I got to say, COVID um, reframed a bunch of stuff for me. Having COVID, because I was so sick for, I mean, for three mm -hmm. weeks, I was like, so sorry. I, well, I was sick for three months, but for three weeks, I literally didn't know what was up and what was down. Um, uh. And the world went on fine without me. Uh, and so I thought, wow, <laughs> I can take three weeks and maybe do something fun as opposed to take three weeks and do something exactly. horrible. So we are going to hopefully do that now for our wedding anniversary. Oh, now great. I'm getting my wish. That's right. So. <laughs> does, your, does your wife like to travel, Ken? She does, but, you know, we have children at home. Uh -huh. And we are very, very committed parents. So we love spending time with them and being there for them. And they're going to go to college next year. So that'll be our time. You have time twins, to, right? Uh, you have twins. Yeah. Right? We had triplets go off to school. And it was empty nester syndrome affects some people differently than others. Like I, right. I actually enjoyed four years of privacy and aloneness because I'd been with triplets for 18 years straight right. and and some people just get really freaked out but it it's a good time to reconnect and have you know find your inner strengths of your your own self plus you get to travel and see the kids which is fun and see their world you know that's always fun yes. unless yes, yes. they're local but um but, but they do back, come back yeah having them back has been good too though yeah and it's Absolutely. good we, they come back when they're adults Absolutely. and they're a lot nicer but <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i love my kids with all my heart and soul and but i when they were 18 That's i was like way. three 18 year olds imagine it was a lot so let me let me address some of this the but good here. luck with that i hope that it is you guys can you know find solace and work and love and travel and whatever you want to do right. I'm, now i'm giving you advice well, thank but you. Uh, does it work for me well drew had three television shows at the time too so that made him happy that kept everybody busy yeah and it was right. fun it was i mean we were really lucky that they left for school right when he he hit the frying pan hot so Got i was it. you know I, we were juggling a lot but um and then and then when it's when it stops susan feels abandoned she feels very personally <laughs> hurt i'm like dude this, that's the nature of this thing did that's i really you, oh you were always like they didn't like they never call us they don't like us anymore blah, blah, blah. i'm like that's they're on to the next thing they're they're working that's uh, that's what happens you all see them again G said something really funny to me though one time she goes you know everybody loves dr drew but you're a lot more interesting <laughs> <laughs> well, Marcy Hume has sort of been uh, floating around that topic too. Okay, so uh, Patty, Patty, uh, oh, oh, what's Patty's last name? I lost her. Patty Ford. Uh, ringing my ear is pretty much stopped now. In fact, I just told Ken, I think before the mic heated up, that I feel like my COVID brain thing, I, like I got my brain back today. I had, I've been trying to run, uh, doing running, and the, I felt well enough to run, which is an important sign to me that I'm doing pretty good. But the runs have been extremely challenging. Like, I'm very, like, I don't know, just plodding through them. And today I ran and ran well. While I was running, I did my Greek lessons, and it stuck. And, yeah. and, and the ringing in my ears, it's there, but it comes and goes, and it's mostly gone now. Um, it's so a weird thing. It's it's oh, have, COVID it's brain's a, interesting. Doctor Drew, do you have ringing in your ears, or is this Patty? I, no, me. I had I had developed from COVID terrible tinnitus in my right a ear. A lot like, of people like who have unreal. had COVID have it though. Yeah, like was when it first developed, it was well, like startling. It was like a buzzing, wow. and then it stayed. 
uh, stayed all, you know, I got long hauler syndrome, so I was weak and I couldn't do stuff. And, um, and the ringing was intense. Uh, and then I started fluvoxamine and the ringing went away immediately, like, like 30 minutes later. And then it kind of came back and then it kind of got better. And my syndrome got better. I was only on fluvoxamine for two weeks and, um, interesting, right? Uh, yes. Valerie, Ed has ringing in his ears because he had some treatments when he was a young man, if you recall. And those treatments damage nerves, and things that damage nerves um, can cr damage cranial nerves. And the eighth cranial nerve and the whole apparatus in the middle, the inner ear is very delicate and gets uh, hit by viruses and chemicals and chemotherapeutic agents, things like that. Wow. It's very common. So uh, if you, you notice that with, with uh, COVID, it makes Patty said it could me. last one year wait who said that patty said patty ford but it makes perfect sense to me look we know that it hits the first cranial nerve right you lose your sense of smell it hits the 12th cranial nerve you lose your sense of taste and why couldn't it hit the eighth uh, there's nothing special about the you know, the one and the 12 but just anatomy and the eighth nerve i think in my case got hit pretty good um and i think that's what happens and we and we look at this what's going on under the microscope and the nerves it's actually micro what's called a microangiopathy it's actually blood vessel damage as well as maybe some active viral infection of the of the both the glial cells the glue cells and maybe even the <laughs> monocytes that are there uh sort of responsible to protect the glial cells so there's a lot of stuff going on that sets the covid was very complicated yeah very we're gonna we're gonna be learning about it for the next 10 years i, I guarantee it uh all right we've Ken. talked a lot about it too over the last year yes, somebody on here said susan gets 14.99 on a super chat for a bottle of wine thanks for the non-covid guest yes she's, <laughs> she, yeah. i made 15 dollars today by booking you ken so i want to thank you very oh, much oh i'm that. so glad the, the other pleasure. thing can i share that wine with yeah. valerie allen <laughs> the other thing, ken, right. you, you mentioned she again deserves it. i will i will uh r remind everyone the book it, i want to get the name of the book right and push career, career, push, career choreography. choreography can you push it out there susan push there it is career choreography ken linder Lots of uh, advanced excitement about it. People who read it and uh, offered uh, assessments and blurbs. Important people, people that uh, know, well, they benefited many of them from Ken's choreography. Um, I don't know if you could hear that. I hope you could. But okay. before, before, again, also before the mic started heating up, Ken, you, you had mentioned, I thought I heard you say that your kids going to college figured into the writing of this book somehow. And I, I, I wondered how. Did you say that or did I misinterpret what you I said? Don't, I don't think I said that, but um, I do think, by the way, that uh, well, I said that because of COVID, I had the chance to write the book. You, you did say and that, my, but, but you said something about that. But also, they're... and our kids are at home, ah. and it was a blessing that I could spend this oh, okay, year with okay, them because it was, it, was. It, was a, it was a found year because they should have been in college on Got campus, it. Got but it. they did it virtually. Got it. Uh, I'm going back to the restream, guys. I, well, Ken, I think we've covered uh, most of the material uh, that we can cover without giving it all away. Everybody's you know? very happy okay. and you know laughing on a stream. Um, you, you brought joy and happiness to our followers. Well, well, I, Susan, I'm very optimistic. This is an opportunity for people to you know, reinvent themselves, get a great second act, and just figure out what it is they, they do really well their skill sets, all the things we talked about, but with vaccines coming around, with companies on the rebound, with jobs coming back, this is your chance to really do something fun and, and yeah. also be fulfilled. Yeah, uh, fulfillment, a service, uh, creativity. Yes. These are all the kind of words we were talking about today. And and there there is a, you know, uh, the, the opportunity for kind of, I don't want to say a reset because that's becoming sort of a weird catch term, but just the idea that there's a time now where you can do an assessment, a fresh start. I know I'm feeling it, uh, and I can imagine other people are feeling it too uh, because it's just been an extraordinary time, and we should uh, not waste it. We should take a good look sure. at it and learn from it, and, and I, I think going to get some career choreography and seeing mm -hmm. if we can improve what we do in the world it uh, could be a yeah, a lot of lot of positive feedback on the restream about put we put it up there so these people are like fulfillment is big they're volunteering okay, okay. they they like they have lots of ideas about what they might want to be and doing. And we have a new Positivity. guy on there who's calling himself Bill Gates, and he's cracking everybody up. What is Bill Gates saying? <laughs> <laughs> he said he spent $20,000 with his name on YouTube. 
<laughs> what? Oh, to get the name? Bill Gates. <laughs> I don't know. I saw Joe Giannotti laughing at him. I know they're having a good time over there. Uh, uh oh. Uh, Anthony Brown saying he's in Squaresville now. Oh, Na Anthony, I'm dragging you way into Squaresville. Don't you worry about that. You're going to see how square Squaresville is <laughs> soon enough. All right, I'll let Ken go. I'm just sort of uh, bantering with the restream here. Yeah, uh, they I'm, were fun. I, I'm thinking about maybe uh, plugging in with Clubhouse for a minute or two just to see what people are up to. Okay. But uh, well, let's let Ken go in the meantime. Ken, such a pleasure always. God to bless see you, you when, Ken. Whenever we run into Thank each you, other, Dr. it's Drew, always Susan. been a pleasure. Absolutely. And I'm always here for you, my friend. Oh, thank for you. For both of you. Thank you okay? so much, Ken. All right, buddy. Take thank care. Thank you so much. Sell okay. out the books. Bye. Take care. Right. Yes, thank you. All right, there goes Ken. Uh, why don't we head over to uh, Clubhouse for a minute or two? Want to do that, guys? I only see. have like ten minutes, and then I got. Oh, well, have I have a go. little more time. I could, I could do. Um, no, I could do a little bit. All right, I, I just, I, I, I like the idea of hopping on to Clubhouse. Right, I just think it's an interesting thing to do. Give, give me the camera up here while we uh, do our thing. I will. Um, just give me a second. Sorry. Hold uh, on. Ken was great. Poncho. Tanya says, "Good." Hold on, Poncho. All right, I'm on YouTube hanging out. Uh, waiting for you guys to set up a room. Trying Raise to look hand. at my phone and see what's going on. Uh, so, some some of you guys have been asking for YouTube. Um, Valerie, thanks for Kenny. Valerie Allen, check out Valerie Allen. Uh, PR. PR. If you guys need PR, Valerie Allen. Uh, oh, Joe Giannotti is in here. All right, Joe, let's bring you up. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand. I have trouble bringing. I have trouble navigating this thing without the hand up. Uh, Tell everybody we're live. When they, yeah, come we are, in, when they pile in. Well, it's just Joe at this point. Uh, so, <laughs> Hi, Joe. Uh, Joe, raise your hand. There you go. All right, Joe, come on up. Raise your hand, God damn uh, <laughs> Let's see if he can come in here. I want to know what was so funny, Bill Gates. Yeah, who is Bill Gates, Joe? I have no idea. <laughs> he, but but I keep asking him for $5 $10 million. <laughs> oh, and he goodness. better deliver. And he better deliver. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> uh, what'd you uh, think? By the way, yeah. what, the other thing that you missed was because you had asked me, um, you know, are you watching replays of when Ben Stein's money? I was. So I said as a joke on the on the stream that you should have it. We should have a new show called Win Dr. Drew's Money. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, that uh, that kind of thing has been suggested to me. That seems so scary one, to me to be Ben Stein. Drew, I mean, ben that Stein, was one. Uh, what? I'm me. a game show aficionado. Yes. And I have to tell you that. I have to tell you, excuse me, I have to tell you that win Ben Stein's money is the most difficult game. I know. I know. In game show history. I know. And I, I could see how tough it was. And people have kind of been at me to do something like that. I'm like, I don't know. Do you see me on 25 words or less? Uh, I have not. So but that was I, but, great. But, was but great I will experience. in the next few minutes. Great experience. And here, here's what happened. I had 18 seconds. I had five words or something. Uh, or, no, I, I had... I had a lot of time and I had adequate clues and I, and I was just, and I think it was five, and I was just nailing it. I was going North, South television news. It was just, right. I, I nailed every, every, every one. And I was down with like 12 seconds left or 18 seconds left. 18 is in my head. And I had six clues left. And I said, I said with those six clues, I love a man in a, and they were like a cardigan, a suit, a sweater. Do you, do you know what I was going for, Joe? Or my or my main show, my, my game show skills this, that bad? It almost sounds like it almost sounds like the modern day password. I yeah, it is. Wait, like can that. you answer it, Joe? Joe I, I love, love a, a man. man in a. To have six clues is unheard of in that show, and it just occurred. I just looked okay. at it and went, "Oh my god, I've got six clues, and I can use this." And the word you try to think of is, "I love a man in a." Yes. Okay. Monica Ricci screaming it on the reaching uniform, and they uniform, could, okay. they couldn't come up with it. They were like, <laughs> they were like Joe. cardigan sweat. They I I literally was lying on the ground with the with this computer screen over my face. I could not believe it. I love a man in a banana hammock. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, so anyway, Joe. Uh, anything? anything <laughs> it was else a family show. Going so on with you out there. That. I'm hanging in. I'm doing. Yeah. I'm doing uh, pretty good. I I was you know I. I was glad I watched today. I watched yesterday's show, and yesterday's show was really good. Mm. What did we do yesterday? I've already um, forgotten. <laughs> you had the you had the uh, OCD 
Gallon. Oh yeah, she was yes, quite good. the OCD she doctor. Was quite because good. yeah, because I, I have to admit that I can relate with some of that. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, me too. I've got it for sure. I've, I've known forever. I've had it, and uh, you know, when you're younger, it could be twitches and you know, preoccupying thoughts and things and obsessions, and and then it goes later in life into anxiety and all that good stuff. Uh, it's sort of how it works. <laughs> Pocket but, full of posy in his birthday suit. <laughs> I, will not, I, I will not talk about. I will not talk about uh, um, specific data. Because um, I I'm I'm working on it tonight, but okay. uh, and and, the, and but we do know, and I'm trying not to say the word because that word is banned today, according to Susan. So, um, well, I will I tell will you, a, a lot of people, Michigan's a, going down. Yeah, Michigan's I was gonna say, going to say everything's going down, and but a lot of Hallelujah. Inf- a, a lot of uh, like I said, co- conversation out there in in the I wouldn't say it's scientific literature so much as in the sort of some epidemiologic literature that they are they are really starting to talk about what you've been saying all along which is the the uh weather trends the, seasonal the, the, the seasonal trends seasonal. That, yeah the yeah. seasonality may be a much bigger deal than we knew and that the us doing anything with lockdowns and this and that may not be they're trying to figure out if it's if it's anything so let me get some more college up here okay Joe? yeah go ahead have all a great right, evening thank you buddy uh joshua your hand is up go ahead buddy what's up hey dr drew hey man um so i'm I'm finding that i'm having a little bit of anxiety uh getting back to everything yeah um just normal things like getting a haircut uh and i was wondering i know you you kind of feel like you have it or i'm sure you probably you're probably the best person to talk to with anxiety, um, yeah, I certainly know it intimately. I mean, I had a lot of therapy that reduced it from anything troubling, um, but I am still wired up with OCD and anxiety. That's sort of a thing. Um, I can tell you that my biggest source of anxiety that 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 makes my the kind of anxiety you're talking about less tolerable is that the world is making me anxious all the time. Cancel culture is making me anxious. <laughs> uh, Chauvin trials are making me anxious. The homeless uh, but, homeless committee. Make, uh, there's lots of things making me anxious in the world. And then my own stuff just gets put on top of that. And so you have to, you know, manage what you can. Uh, and a little bit of, um, you know, uh, if, if I were a recovering person, I, you know, I would focus on the first three steps, you know, and just trying to turn it over as best I can. And uh, again, support from other people and being realistic and, you know, changing the things you can change, as they say, you know, how the, the, the sobriety prayer. prayer. So um, you're occupying you're, you're occupying yourself with uh, something that has nothing to do with the moment that you I might just can't do anything anxiety. about it. I can't do anything about yeah. it. it. It is troubling, but it's not something I can really c- control or do anything about. And it makes me anxious. Uh, and so. The healthy thing to be is to turn it over, let it go. Um, not, I'm not saying ignore these things because a lot of important things happening these days, but uh, to try to find a way to to manage it, whether it's meditation, prayer, focus. I, for me, it's again running. I've been running, and that's been very, very helpful. And learning a new language has been very, very helpful. It's just these sorts of things. Uh, any of the other of you in the uh, audience here that want to speak, you just raise your hand, and I can bring you up to the. Uh, to the microphone if you wish uh let me uh we're just running out of time we're only going to be in this room for a few minutes uh tom cigars uses cigars as a meditation to stay out of jail i don't want to i wouldn't want to see tom's on a bad day uh, susan what are you doing you, you're lost back there oh no i'm buying a, a wedding gift oh <laughs> Okay. I feel so that, uplifted that means- by that <laughs> guest today. I'm spending money. Good. No, mm-hmm. I just feel like he was so Speaking of my helpful. anxiety. Uh, Ken Lindner, the uh, author of uh, Career, career Choreography, cho- choreography mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And he was so positive and uplifting. He gave me a warm feeling yeah. like Howard Lapidus. Mm-hmm. He gave me this like sort of warm feeling. I know why uh, Colleen Williams loves him so much. Yeah. brings him up a lot. But... Yeah. He just has this. He has good insight into human nature, and it, it's it's very rea- reassuring and and refreshing. I liked it. 
Well, so got... I'm so I'm and I'm going to a baby sh- a wedding shower on Sunday, and I have to buy a gift. Fantastic! I'm looking at the audience. If any of you want to raise your hand, I can bring you up to the microphone here. But I'm going to kind of wrap things up in just a minute because I know. And I'm getting my hair done today. I'm so excited. That's good. This is it's been good. about a month and a half, and I'm starting we, to look like are, an old cat lady. We are, we are going off the rails we did last night. So let's let's kind of wrap things up. Um, I'm going to close down this room because no one seems to want to chat. Well, so we didn't really it. introduce and I it didn't, very well. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, but thank you, Joe, for calling in. We love hearing your voice. It's such a great voice. Yeah. And uh, we will next time probably. What's up tomorrow? Tomorrow I don't have anybody booked. Okay, but so we maybe can do, we can do real, cl- really do the clubhouse then tomorrow. We'll do a little promotion and we'll come up, come up with some topics to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, why don't you come up with some good topics and after not COVID. dark is tomorrow, so I think I'll be with Christina. How about something not COVID for yeah. a little while? And, well, coming out of that, there's always stuff to talk about. Yeah, uh, or whatever people want to talk about, it's fine. Also, I'm giving a talk at Wilkes University on Friday at nine or ten. Yeah, are we Pacific. supposed to be promoting that? I don't know. I don't know if I'll, I will just now. Well, I don't Caleb know. said I was supposed to get an email and I haven't seen anything. So are you in touch with them directly? No, they don't give me anything. I, I, I know I've been doing a bunch of interviews and stuff there locally in Pennsylvania. Maybe we should get in touch with Jackie. She needs to. Yeah, I, sure. I don't know if it is something. Because I didn't get an email. So. Yeah, I didn't either. But I, I'm doing an interview tomorrow morning. So, uh, it's But tomorrow if you morning? guys, I'm doing an interview tomorrow morning. Oh. The show, the I thought presentation it was Friday. is on Friday. I'm doing an interview tomorrow morning. The presentation is on Friday. I mean, and and if you want to come, I think people can come. Yeah, you can. Uh. Leopold, do you th- believe our DNA and our historical background can make us more nervous OCD, especially your Jewish background? Uh, Spielkus is a real thing. Um, that's genetics, straight up. That's straight up genetics, right? Uh, and why that was selected for is a pretty complicated process. Um, but, you know, w- and what those genetic groupings are and, you know, why you end up with those symptoms, I mean, it, it could be things other than natural selection, right? Because there's a lot of not really inbreeding, but a lot of ethnic ethnic uh, closeness in terms of the genetics. And maybe that created some of this stuff. Or maybe uh, back when people were, Jews were surviving in slavery or in uh, concentration camps, having some of these qualities kept you more alert and on top of things and made it higher probability of surviving. Or it's just massive intergenerational trauma, which is another cause of anxiety and, and OCD-like stuff. So, which uh, certainly is another part of the story. Uh, okay, guys, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate it. We appreciate Ken Linder. Uh, tomorrow we'll probably do chatting almost exclusively, though I do have a bunch of guests I want to get in here, Susan. Right. So yeah, I know. I've sent you some more people. I know. And if you guys have guests, people you want me to talk to, uh, we love when you suggest The world it. is your oyster, honey. Yeah. Uh, but I got to go get my hair did. Right, we'll wrap it up. I'm looking at Anthony's note there about teaching side by side with the police. Yeah, dude, man, you're in Squaresville now. You're the man. Okay, I'm going to play the ad and I go get my All hair right, done. We'll see you tomorrow. Love you guys. Bye. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients. Plus, each single-serving easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great-tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, uses all natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code DRDREW25 for a I've struggled with various digestive issues over the years, so gut health is extremely important to me. Now, while gut health awareness has increased, it has led to a wellness trend that inspired a host of kind of questionable marketing claims and even false claims. You've seen the word probiotic attached to all kinds of supplements, drinks, and more, and they may claim to deliver the healthy microorganisms our guts need for proper function, but all too often the promises are really too good to be true. Thankfully, I became aware of a company called Seed and their flagship product, the Daily Symbiotic. That's right. Seed's Daily Symbiotic offers 24 clinically researched strains of microorganisms in a single dose. 
These strains support gut, skin, and heart health and promotes regularity, sometimes within as little as 24 to 48 hours. To me, what really sets Seed's daily symbiotic apart is its delivery system. This is my supply. While some products may offer the right strains, they are fragile and they rarely survive the trip through your gut. Seed uses a capsule in capsule design that helps ensure that 100% of the probiotics reach your colon where they matter most. Now, I've been taking Seeds Daily Symbiotic, and I encourage you to check out their story and the science behind what they do. To try it for yourself, just go to seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew for 20% off your first month of Daily Symbiotic. That is seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code D-R-D-R-E-W, Dr. Drew. 